And that's all the news now, so we can get that out of the way. Okay, fair enough. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you guys are looking at this issue of commercial goods. Is that going to be a centerpiece of uh, a I think it's a very cool topic. I think it's interesting what was mentioned during the panel earlier on as well about how, you know, there are a lot of kids, obviously, based around uh, kids, there are a lot of kids who, as you said, they never walk an actual CD in their lives. So they can do it quite well and online. That's a virtual item piece, so just as bad as, as the actual CD itself. And I think, you know, when you see how uh, virtual worlds well, are out of the broad and horizons to the extent that you can be, you can be frank with the world across the globe. And if you're going to express your reality across the globe, you want to show them the places that you want them to see. And so virtual goods are a very good way of doing that. It allows you to, to show somebody living in China or Russia or North America, you know, what it is that you actually want to express yourself about. So can you give us some examples of some uh, things we may be able to buy in a few months' time, or whatever well, it may be? You know, well, I, without mentioning any, any names, I think um, that uh, you know the obvious things are kind of brand new One of the one of the beauties of uh, virtual items, and I'm not going to give away any pricing information before anybody else, is that um, you know for a relatively small amount of money, compared to the actual price of the original or the actual the real uh, item of clothing, for instance, you can dress yourself in the design of clothing that you really like to wear in your life. But maybe can't afford to. And that in itself projects a kind of image to, to the other people you meet as the person that you are. So that's just an example of the way that you could uh, you could put all your personality together. Mm -hmm. um, David, I know you want to talk a little bit about how the virtual goods might cross back over. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I also told you that it seems a little bit disrespectful to be sitting in the audience of everybody standing up and, and, and engaging you, if you don't mind. Not at all. Um, it, so usually what I do is ask the audience to tell me whether they read blogs and uh, whether they uh, know about Wikipedia and whether they have an avatar. And that is when everybody goes blank. So that will be the first question here. Can everybody who has an avatar raise uh, his or her hand? That's, that's the right audience, right? So now please keep your hands up. And who has never heard of 3D printers, put your hands down. Okay. Who does not own a 3D printer? Put his or her hands down. Any hands up there? Looks like a couple, one or two, one or two. Okay. So that is that is the technology threshold that we are now crossing. And my thesis, in just a, a, a very quick slide, one slide, is that uh, we use uh, virtual worlds, online worlds, as a technology training ground for evolving useful objects where we use community uh, to measure quantitatively the benefit of the object being given out and spread with variations iteratively. And this is the basic definition of evolution, where no the professional designer or the community actually has a clue where the thing is going, but since we are measuring it, when the threshold is crossed, that has been set, we can find classes of objects that can be brought back to the physical world by 3D printers. And today this is a small set of objects, maybe we will start with something like uh, badges for communities, where the emotional investment in finding the right badge through 10 iterations in the uh, range of two weeks is so big that there can be no prize that each member of the community will pay for only the physical version of the virtual batch that all of us work together to But in the future, there will be, uh, of course, printers for electronic parts, uh, programmable logic, mechanical parts. It will be all strung together in uh, something that we can deliver. So do you have a 3D printer, there? Yes. You do? How much did you pay for it? Uh, well, if you don't mind me asking. No, no, of course. Uh, I don't own a, a, a Zeta printer, but I have access to a Zeta printer, uh, which is just fine, you know, um, depending on the type of job. And uh, I own a, 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 a FabLab printer, FabLab.org. Uh, anybody can own one. Uh, if you are lazy, it's $3,000. If you want to build it based on the parts, the list of parts is available for $1,000. And uh, the next generation of printers, uh, uh, Reprap.org, is the 
Darwin machine, which prints itself. <laughs> is, this, is this the point where I should start being afraid? <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I was at the UN. Okay. I was at the World Business Forum yesterday, where Ray Kurzweil said open source and nanotech is going to deliver the goals of communism. And this was in front of 3,000 top managers and Colin Powell was taking off the name. So, yes, people are afraid. Okay, well, we'll get to the, uh, the economics of uh, virtual, virtual goods in a moment. But um, I'm just curious, um, Mike, you said you've been studying avatars and, and virtual worlds for the last few years. How have you seen uh, people's attitudes towards virtual worlds? The main, the main thing to see happening is that, first of all, I think we have to think about what we've already heard is that, quite obviously, the virtual world is really defined by three things um, identity construction, communication, and I think very important, actually, your point, experimentation as well. Um, and what we've seen over the coming years, uh, passing years and coming years, is that, in fact, that experimentation has become increasingly mainstream. Um, effectively, we're right in the customer of virtual worlds opening up everything. Still, we've got some barriers of access, so it's still difficult to get up and get going and kind of thing. But as that begins to break through, we're beginning to see a lot of the kind of drivers from the real world that we, we again, we just talked about, we've been making washing machines towards all the kinds of products, um, bits and pieces that we need to construct ourselves. And we're just moving into virtual worlds and saying, okay, we need those. And, and increasingly, we're going to look at some of those brands as well. Uh, and it's a very interesting comment earlier on about the brands being um, authentic if you want in this space. Uh, but we will need those brands because those brands are so important to constructing our identities. We will carry that identity construction into the virtual world as well. So, so, Paul, would you agree that virtual goods at this point are maybe mostly about kind of building your online identity, or do any of these have any actual utility? I guess I'm kind of interested in virtual goods uh, as proxies for existing real world goods. Not imagined real world goods are co evolving real world goods. And it's somewhat more prosaic than the uh, value attached or whatever sort of status. Um, is imparted by a virtual goods of the avatar. I'm thinking just really basic stuff, and that I think that virtual worlds and virtual items in virtual worlds are poised, um, you know, to revolutionize today's web-based e-commerce, and it's going to happen because it restores uh, to e-commerce the social and even recreational aspect of shopping, which was stripped away. When, um, and that's a, 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 a central portion, a central element of commerce in the real world. That was stripped away when retailers went online. It, it became one person sitting in front of a 2D web page. It was a, uh, a solitary experience, transaction based. The social and recreational aspect of going shopping, window shopping, trying things on, commenting with your friends um, uh, disappeared. Well, that's going to change very quickly as, as, as this becomes the platform for. Uh, for shopping for real world goods, and there's that social element. I think it's going to just transform you. Okay. Um, let's let's get into the, the nitty gritty of you know what are the how how is the uh, economics change when you're talking about a world where maybe there's no scarcity, where there's uh, you know you're talking about being able to take one item and reproduce it endlessly. Um, I mean, you said you were talking about pricing in Sony Home. How do you price something? When, I'm sorry, you were very pointedly not talking about pricing. You were about to talk. But how do you come up with a price tag on something when you know the cost of producing it may be you know very close to zero? Well, I think first of all, I would just the idea that it's impossible to to regulate the supply. Um, it's very easy to have a regulated supply of virtual items. Um, you can just decide how many of that item are going to be available. And then but it's kind of an artificial scarcity, right? It's not, it's it's not imposed by a lack of raw materials. No, no, it's not it's not then it comes down to the rarity factor and the desirability factor of having something that only has a limited number of people have got. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there, there can be a pricing structure for the rare kind of items. Uh, I think we can probably see this in things like Facebook, for instance, where they have the rare items that are you know, much more expensive than the, than the everyday items. Um, Can I just ask the audience, who here has bought something for a friend on Facebook? Any hands up? Got a few hands. 
Um, so I guess maybe we're not quite there yet on, on something like Facebook, but the potential no, is. It also depends on what you do with that item. I mean, you know, uh, without having to, to uh, ask these questions, I think part of the thing about the items on Facebook is that they don't use it for so just to kind of communicate with people. Mm -hmm. They're communicating with people. Um, whereas I think virtual items within the virtual world have potentially much more use to the user. I think, you know, going back to what Paul was saying about the idea of Experimenting, you know, being able to sort of go, go shopping again. Uh, the virtual world works both ways as well. It gives the user the opportunity to experiment with stuff, you know, either on their person or in the living area. I mean, you can imagine trying out the surround sound system, you know, where you place the light violence within the room, you know, all these kind of things. It, it obviously, it's obviously much more difficult to tell, you know, in a, in a real world situation, and then this is the sort of thing that not uh, many people are not going to do. On the other side, but just uh, completely what I'm going to say is that from a, from a brand partner's perspective as well, it gives them the opportunity to try stuff. You know, the number of uh, clothes that go to the fashion shows that don't really go into production because they can make fun of that. You know, the, the amount of experimentation that a brand can do online and get the vote of people who are actually going to be interested in buying the product and then decide what to uh, turn into production is a huge opportunity. Sorry, uh, just, it just occurred to me, um, uh, because uh, virtual items, as you pointed out, don't, uh, often don't have much functional utility. They are, uh, it, is a, it is an imagery thing. The analog in the real world is luxury. You know, there is no limit of supply, but you, it's, it's based upon, I mean, you limit supply, not because of raw materials, but you know, in order to price them above what the cost is. And in, in virtual worlds today, uh, we are, on a stage where we were with email 20 years ago, but email systems would not communicate. Now, it looks like a lot of us agree that interoperability is fundamental because meaningful uh, social aspects cannot emerge if there aren't masses there behind. Uh, however, limited supply in an interoperable uh, virtual world setting <laughs> is as if I were driving it from forwarding you email that I received from someone else. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it is the case that actually there are software suppliers, uh, for example, Microsoft, who have tried to impose on the world uh, systems where an email that I received could be on full market. So the question is, is it worth trying to make virtual worlds such like that? Right. I guess the question would be, is it a problem that I have to buy the same t-shirt in Second Life and Home and Hobo, or is that actually an advantage or a business opportunity? You know, ultimately, it's a problem <laughs> because if we can only buy the same, we've got to be different. And if we can't be different, we can't be able to buy the same. So, fundamentally, um, you have to drive um, kinds of goods and products that have community shelf lives for different levels. And the province of goods becomes the problem. Which is very much this like a luxury goods in the real world. It's the problems of the book that actually gives us its value. Mm -hmm. And so I'm afraid I, I, I don't go with a sort of super democratic version where everything's available to all, um, but that in fact doesn't match into the way we want to show that identity. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a lovely idea, but I don't think it's going to actually work because these uh, worlds evolve. We will see uh, more and more of a struggle to establish the reality. Do that, and then look for. Uh, and in fact, it actually, if you want to create commerce, uh, hugely create commerce in the fact because people will buy for exclusivity, for small ones. Mm -hmm. uh, following on the question from uh, about how many people have bought things on Facebook, I'm wondering how many people have bought limited edition CDs or collector's edition CDs. Yeah. A few? Okay. Well, that's also a cultural object with very low cost of reproduction, and it's uh, quote unquote artificial scarcity that's an opportunity to express cultural affiliation. I mean, if you really like radio, you might want to buy something like that. So, right. It's not a, well, I mean, maybe the scarcity comes from the intellectual property. Sure. You know, there's, there's only a limited amount of really creative people that can, say, you know, design something, and so that therefore. That's true. Really yeah. Or, or who paid uh, a non zero amount to have a radio at all? All of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, there, there you go. Uh, and uh, to, to your point, uh, uh, scarcity cannot only uh, be in 
opposed uh, from the supply side, but actually can desire from the demand side. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is the emotional and cultural investment that communities uh, put to uh, either uh, a given object or a variation of uh, an object where it is not that you cannot have it, it's that you do not desire to have it because you don't identify with the values that the, the digital object uh, uh, and I'd like to pose a little question, which is that to get the to maximize the business potential of virtual goods, is it better to have an open system where anyone can create something in Solana, or is it better to, from a business perspective, is it better to kind of limit the people who can access your market and sell things? Or coffee? <laughs> we'll, we'll assume that there's perfect uh, copyright protection, even though that's far from the case. <laughs> no, no, we have to manage pose the question because our world will never, never make bits less copyable than they are. And sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm both the word doctor of that. Bits are not going to be less copyable in the future. Perfect copyright is, is, is not uh, possible to be involved tomorrow. But to answer your question, if we keep digital creation to underlay we will have uh, just those goods developed that this elite presumes are possible or desirable. How can we so um, limit in our fantasy, our desires to, to think that there aren't other things there? So absolutely, uh, and, and you know, multiple universe is not on this panel, but multiverse is about opening it up. And if we close it down, and we are wrong, and we'll first will just plainly win. Now, I think that's a good question for you, Peter, because from my understanding, at least in the beginning, there won't be uh, ability for users to create content in Sony Home. Can you walk us through why you made that decision? Well, it's not a decision that we make. It's not a policy decision. It's a question of the decision. We But, I mean, there are a lot of virtual worlds out there that allow that, so it seems like the technology is not out of reach. So can you see, can you say that, that within the medium term that you will really be able to create content within Sony Home? Depending on the definition of medium term, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can define it for me. <laughs> That's our intention is absolutely to supply the tools. I mean, it's, it's a case of tools we need to, because PS3 isn't there, um, and it's a, you know, it's a specific part of it, configuration that requires some development environment. You know, we, we need to supply the tools to be used. Now, as soon as we're able to supply those tools, then yeah, absolutely, it's our intention to make sure we have the right objects which they can then sell into our users as well. I think in terms of pricing for those uh, goods, because obviously the, the next question is what will prevent some guy just rolling out billions and millions of the same way? If some guy's rolling out billions and millions of the same way, the value of which we're going to pay for it is going to be minimal. Yeah. And I think that, you know, <laughs> Guys, there are making limited editions of 10 of each item that we create, and as we can have there, then you know, there's, there's a possibility that people will be prepared to pay a large amount of money for those items. If he's just rolling around as fast as his PC can uh, churn uh, out, then uh, you know, we don't have much value. It's, it's the talent that scares, not the pixels. I mean, Matt, as you know, this has been a huge issue in Second Life with the whole coffee bot uh, fiasco. I mean, how do you guys approach this, especially when you're dealing with a client who may be distributing goods and they you know, they want to have some control over uh, it's, a technical, it's a technical and security issue. You do invest a lot of content. I mean, it's, as people who own the property know, it's, it's a matter of technical protection. Do you always accept a certain a certain degree of, uh, you know, unpredictability there? Uh, well, I'm just the PR guy, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not responsible for blocking the files, but, uh, you know, that, that's all I can say. Is that we work very hard to protect it. Right. Um, I guess there's no reason why virtual world should be any different when it comes to mocking now. No, we view it as completely analogous. David, I'm sorry. Go ahead, David. <laughs> well, uh, we touched uh, an element that I think at uh, least is crucial, which is user interfaces. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, we started to realize that we are paying the cost of 20 years of user interface load now. There hasn't been a lot of experimentation in user interfaces. And now that we have the need 
to have consumers who are not technical to come and create, the, 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 the people who create the faces don't know how to let them. Because for 20 years we have been happy with items and folders. Uh, and, and I'm looking forward to score, which uh, has been uh, shown uh, at, at another great conference uh, and, and looks great and exactly loves what you have been saying for everybody to be able to come in and, and do something, you know, not unlimited amount of changes, but do a lot from the consumer point of view. I'm sensing this is a, a topic that everyone, the people in the audience are really like to weigh in on, so I'm, let's open it up for some questions. Or not, I can be completely <laughs> in worlds of three people or fewer. And, and that, uh, given that what we're talking about is, is competition for time and attention, uh, as well as competition for money, there is, what, what you're describing, this, this dynamic, well, if it doesn't have mass appeal and doesn't attract money, then it's not relevant, misses the point that if the majority, as we see, the majority of material that people consume is user-created, uh, then uh, the appetite for commercial material is necessarily diminished because so much of their time uh, budgets and attention budgets are being occupied by non-commercial material that, as you say, no one will ever pay for, but is, is successful on axes that have nothing to do with their production values, but rather with the personal experience of consuming something your neighbor made. But well, that's, that's assuming that you spend all your time rifling through everything that everybody else has created. That's assuming that there are no devices that allow you to differentiate between information that other people The reason that's what you would it brings up relevant stuff where you can be of any given niche and still the sum of those niches will fill up your time, anybody's time, and the broad appeal just doesn't apply anymore. It, it, it is not relevant and, and, and that is the value that Google retains. So in virtual worlds uh, and in retail, we must understand what is the equivalent of the Right. Well, maybe we don't have it. Well, we, we, we probably don't have it yet, but uh, that is where we come from because we have an analytic suites uh, where we measure usability through usage. And I was talking about a badge. How many times do you flash your badge? Are you proud of it? And do you share it? Do you pass it on? That is what it makes it useful, emotionally invested, and probably relevant. I mean, I was intrigued by the example that James brought up this morning um, about Armani and Second Life being nowhere you know, near the quality as what people would just kind of build from the ground up. So you're homegrown entrepreneurs. I'm curious what you guys think about how opening up the means of production will kind of tilt the playing field. I think, uh, first of all, I, I, I agree with that opening up the means of production is absolutely essential to growth from virtual worlds. Um, the key thing it creates is choice. And it actually creates markets. Um, and it also gives an inherent advantage to that form of production. Uh, it isn't to say that large, you know, real world brands don't have a role to play, but it's just that they're, I think, probably a bit of a comment by Jerry Ron, that power is actually diminished. Well, it takes away their advantage of owning factories yeah. and distribution. Absolutely. Yeah. But uh, the infrastructure of the 
sits behind the global government is actually diminished because the infrastructure can be available to do what we all want to get to a large extent. Um, I think that, that that is extremely liberating and uh, quite fascinating to see. However, we've also got to bear in mind if virtual world continues to expand, I think we will hope that it continues to expand and um, have a more of mass appeal. Then, however we might look at it, real world brands will bring over ever more consistently into the virtual world. Some more successful than others. Some more successful than others. Right. So I think we're going to have an extremely interesting dynamic. It sounds like mass chaos, right? Yeah. Really. <laughs> <laughs> And so, from, from 
from my perspective, I'm interested in the comments as to why should the virtual world be a way to create contextual context within which people who are designing their living room and dragging in a flat screen TV could not get, you know, free eBay uh, auctions on it, or Amazon, or go to the Home Depot and buy it right there in the context in which they're looking for. All right, let's take the first question first. Um, Cyberworld obviously has been a huge success in South Korea. Why haven't we seen any uh, successes outside? I, I would dispute that we haven't seen some of the successes. I think, you know, Guy Online is very successful, for example, in the United States. Or uh, I think we heard from Star all earlier today. I mean, I think those are analogous platforms. But are there some structural issues that have kind of impeded the uh, progress? I mean, things like broadband and, and <coughs> micropayments? I think that's part of it. I think some of it maybe marketing What's, what's, what's holding things back at the moment? I don't know, I suspect it is a lot of those days of cultural differences. We really don't have a sense that we want to take in the case of the Korean and so on. How much we used to do things is the way that we can use the numbers of the money. And the Americans are in the real case and they're more used to some subscription more than anything. So I think a lot of it comes down to you know, the way in which we can spend the money. But obviously, you know, over time, it's better. I know, Susan Blue has made the argument that virtual goods are services, so maybe is there a subscription model for uh, you know, t-shirts and decorations for your virtual house? Yeah, um, how it works and uh, you know, how it stacks up against the money side of things and whether the two can do it together and decide that you know, those are the same sex in terms of I guess it could be bad at the end of the month when you forget to pay your bill and all your clothes disappear. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? Can't see that there, so. Hi, um, Derek Sander with the idea. Um, I have a question from the panelists on how I to Peter and this specifically. When you look at the evolution of the internet in its early days, there were many people who tried to operate closed environments. AOL, CompuServe, Microsoft Network, etc. This goes on. They all failed on that basic premise that they tried to close the environment which was intended to be open. So I want to understand what your experiences and thoughts are on the drive towards a common standard and open platform. And to be specifically, is Sony going to take a central goal in determining or participating in defining this central standard? So are you going to have some sort of closed one? bearing in mind the, on the imminent arrival of Google, social worlds, etc. I definitely have to find some sort of open answer there. Yeah, well, did you get that? Yeah. Um, I think as far as, a, as an open standard is concerned, um, it's too early for us to say, uh, you know, we don't, have, we don't have an inherent objection to that. But certainly I don't think that it's our position right now in the nascent state that uh, that I was in to sort of take the running, uh, you know, lead the, uh, lead the running line. Um, as far as putting out a closed world to people, um, one of the things that we appreciate, I think everybody appreciates, about any kind of online service is that you can't predict and prescribe how people are going to use it and, and how it's going to end up. So that's our, our intention with Hertz. And it's very exciting for us as a, as a platform, as a company, is to be able to be involved with a service that is evolving and that allows us to react to what the users do. And it's not, you know, we're very used to putting stock out there on shelves that is finished as soon as people get to see it. The first time they get to see anything is the finished product. We don't really have any chance to develop it unless we do a sequel. Um, so for us it's very exciting to be able to work with the users to see what they're doing with the service and then react accordingly. So that's something that we're certainly very intent on doing. Um, as far as Pioneering an open platform, I'm not sure that it's necessarily our place to do so. Um, but you know, equally, uh, it's something that we'd certainly be very uh, open to, to looking into. And certainly, we have plans to uh, offer a level of connectivity to the home platform from other platforms. Uh, as, you know, this is stuff that's been talked about before. So. Yeah, on, on both the hardware and the software level, with the internet, we had standards that preceded the ones that are success successful now. Um, Token ring instead of Ethernet, X400 or the OSI model instead of the current set of software transforming protocols. So ISIS 
suspect that standards have a, a way of emerging when the time is right. And uh, it, it has been the case in previous uh, uh, panels this, uh, today that uh, we as a community are not sure we are asking the right questions yet. So uh, uh, giving out standards would be pretending that we know the answers before we know the questions. As an agency, we depend on the platform operators to provide us with the channel to communicate, so we do support some standards, but uh, just to echo that point, from, from what we're seeing and hearing, we're not terribly optimistic about the short term. It's going to take people time to work out and some pretty fundamental differences. I think, I think also that in the short term, you, know, you actually tend to develop a funding to in, in quite closed environments, because they're easier to manage and easier to deal with. And then there's a tendency over time for openness to occur. I mean, most of us sitting here will believe in you know, the central electricity supply. But actually, it doesn't happen with those since you need 12 different plugs to move from the bottom of the UK to the top of the UK. But we've, we've all forgotten those things. And actually, if you look at the history of many, many industries and in many markets, they start off very closed and then they go to a phase where they realize that openness is very important. But you have to be at a stage where um, if you like, they're amenable to settlers, and they're amenable to an opportunity for people to come together. I don't think virtual worlds are at that point, but I would, I would expect the trajectory to move in that general direction over time. There is a first mover disadvantage. Mm -hmm. There's a first mover disadvantage where uh, entrenched uh, ways of doing things are what we pretend they are standards, but they are not good at all. As a, as a point in case, I, I was told. Uh, Morning that uh, IPI uh, is going to base its network on uh, IPv6, which is 10 years late from being rolled out in the West. And, and they can't do it because they are smart in the front. So uh, it, will be, it will be very interesting to see how this goes. We have time for one more question. Raise those hands high. All the way to the back, I think I see one. Hi, uh, my, uh, my name is Jeff. Jeff. My question is in regards to licensed goods, and in the real world, a lot of people use licensed goods as a form of social expression. You know, a t-shirt with a character on it, a faded Superman symbol, or a little Miss Naughty t-shirt, things like that. And my question to you guys is, in the virtual world, where virtually everything that the avatar may wear is a form of social expression, do you have a sense of, is that same kind of pattern of behavior, that need for social expression, using uh, brands and imagery in the real world, is that going to be as important in that space, or is it coming, like, coming down to something where you're, where you're, just, you're creating on your own, or is it next? Just love your perspective on that. I'll, uh, I'll steal the answer from my uh, panelists. And uh, Warren Ellis has been writing about Second Life embroideries, and he said that uh, if you look at the houses in Second Life, they're all McMansions, and they're decorated like people, uh, like they watch a lot of MTV cribs. So in other words, they try and make their houses look like what they think rich people look like. And I think that's kind of an early stage thing, but I think we may see the kind of patterns of consumption change uh, when people uh, kind of go native and uh, get used to the virtual worlds. Well, it'd be cool too when the brands that you're licensing or that you're putting on your t-shirt are um, native to the world itself and not real. Yeah, when will we see the first, uh, I guess we've already seen some of the first virtual world brands? Um, Angie Dante? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's the really, reason I, I, I'm referring to my new book, like mentioned, uh, uh, all, all, all our research. That's okay. Case, that's what we're doing. But having said that, the really interesting thing is the new brands that we're involved in these new worlds. So we, we just didn't have so much more choice as well. Okay, thanks very much, everyone.